Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> the devil are you that's right yes it's me it's thursday so that's that's a good thing right yeah fantastic where are you what you're on a treadmill okay just just slow that down what you're on a commute okay well you can look at the other person it's fine we're all human beings if you're on that tube just make a bit of eye contact eye contact is fine don't mean anything does it just smile and say hello People appreciate it. Trust me. In fact, there was one time a few months ago, myself and Griff were in London doing some recordings and a very, very lovely fella tapped us both on the shoulder and uh, took out his his headphones and showed us his phone and he was listening to an episode of the Two Shot Podcast. And things like that are really overwhelming because when you start something like this, you just think, oh, you know, I can't really predict who's going to listen or what they're going to think. You just have to do something that you're proud of. You can't think of the positive and negative uh, reviews coming in. But look, we know that we have the most beautiful listening community. And loads of you showed up last Friday at York Theatre Royal for this very, very special episode of a live recording. And we were really lucky. And I tell you what, And any podcaster will tell you this. When you get invited to a live show, logistically, it's about spinning plates. It it can be very difficult geographically. And also, you've got to be really sensitive about the guests that you're going to get. And luckily, we had two absolute beauties. We were really thrilled that the amazing wordsmith, J.B. Barrington, opened up for us and he had that audience in the palm of his hand and you're going to hear it you're going to hear the first 11 minutes of his set right now but you speak to people in the audience he just went from strength to strength he was just fantastic and then we rolled out the red carpet because we had acting legend mr art malik travel all the way from devon to york to come and have this beautiful, intimate conversation. Uh, I say intimate, you know, in front of an audience. But um, what we spoke about the subject matter was... Uh, it was something else. I loved it so much. And I know we could have done another hour easy. But we were very well aware that people had to get their train. And, if, and I'm really sorry. I know a few people left, like a handful, maybe a handful, maybe a couple... But I know you had to get the train. But look, don't worry. You're not going to miss out because you're going to hear everything right now. Now, speaking of now, um, we've got a few things to say. So after this episode this week, we're going to hit the pause button again. We're just going to have a few weeks off, just have a bit of R&R. And I'll be really honest, I'm a bit burnt out. Uh, I am I'm filming in Manchester, uh, which is where I am again. And uh, we recorded a four brand new, brand spanking new episodes last week. And uh, it's I just need to have a little bit of a rest, if I'm honest. So I've got stuff to sort out, filming to do. So we're just going to take a couple of weeks off and then we'll reconvene. I'll meet you back here in a few weeks and we'll crack on with that. But before that, and another reason why I need to take a bit of time off is because I've got a pen and a piece of paper making notes. Never make notes. 18th of November. I feel really honoured to have been asked on the Majestic Standard Issue podcast. So I am going to be there at King's Place in London, 18th of November, with uh, Mickey and Sarah and Jan and the Standard Issue crew. And it's going to be me, Joe Lysett and Nish Kumar. 
having a chat for uh, for for the standard issue, which you know they only do it once a year, so that's why I'm so bloody honoured. And then on the twenty third, I have been asked to do a Q and A for Pods Up North Festival in Manchester. So if you're there in Manchester, you're there in London. 18th of November, 23rd of November, come along, say hello, and uh, we'll see you, and we'll have a good chat about podcasting. Can we talk enough? I think we probably could, could we, between us all? Great. Speaking of talk, this week, JB Barrington and Art Malik live at the Theatre Royal. Let's get down to it. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please give, give it, it up for JB Barrington! <laughs> Cheers, thanks very much, and thanks for coming out. What an absolute honour to be booked for a part of the Two Shot podcast with Art Garfunkel. That's fantastic, isn't it? I hope he does sounds of silence, although he has lost the curly hair. So, Lovely to be here in York, which is where I live now. Can you imagine that look coming from Salford trying to fit into York? I bought the barber jacket, I got the Labrador and the Hunter Wellies, but they can still, still smell the CSE woodwork grade for you. A mile away, trust me, it's not good. I'm going to do a poem now called, it's about my, uh, my mum's front room. I write lots of nonsense, and this is probably one of them, but my mum's still got the same council house that we grew up in in the 70s in, in, over in Salford. Um, anybody grew up in a council house, just out of interest? Yeah, we are in York, aren't we? So. <laughs> a council house, what's one of those things? We bought one of those in the 80s, but we sold it on for a massive profit. But the reason I wrote this poem is, and it was about the, the ornaments my mum still got on the, and the effigies in the house that she's never got, never got rid of. When we were kids, we didn't go on holiday abroad, but, but my mum had a, a bingo mate called Flo, who used to go to Benidorm and all those sort of places. I'm talking the 70s now, when foreign holidays were like a big thing. And she would come back with all these Spanish gifts, and she would bring them to the house, not to give us gifts, it was to swank with the neighbours to show them. Oh, you've been away again, Flo. Oh yeah, just a, just a two weeks in Benidorm, you know, third time this year. And it was to show the neighbours that they'd been on holiday. They weren't gifts gifts as such. My dad used to say, get that in the pantry or in the back room, we're not interested in that. And she'd bring these Spanish senorita dolls, anyone remember them? And there were toilet roll holders as well with like a Spanish dancing or a senorita or a matador. Uh, and my mum still got all those ornaments, so the idea of the poem was if those things could talk over the years, the 40, 50 years they've been in the house, the kind of tales they could tell. So I was tripping at the time when I wrote the poem, so... <laughs> Of the inanimate objects talking to me. So it goes like this. Was it Benidorm, lands of Rotti, Frangarola or Salou? On velvet maps hung up like plaques in a council house front room. With the wood chip and nanny glipter and a nicotine artex ceiling. The odds and dens and current trends made the 70s kitsch appealing. Was it double diamond, what needs seven up or baby sham? Stacked and stored on the old sideboard that once was the radiogram. And with ornaments in pride, a place from every seaside town. And a mouse was harassed in a green brandy glass by a cat peering over, looking down. Was it Radio Rentals, Radio One, or Radio Luxembourg? That as we choke in a room full of smoke, played the tunes that we hadn't heard. And the flamenco Spanish senorita dolls on the mantelpiece. A gift from Spain, they watched the pulmonary vein fill up with chip pan grease. Was it World in Action, World of Sport, or Walden's Weekend World? And a midweek thrill from Benny Hill and them semi-naked girls and a version of the crying boy cried upon the wall and next to the Pope hung up with rope with St. Peter and St. Paul. Was it cancer, emphysema or a massive heart attack? And the smell of flowers in the final hours turned out all dressed in black. And stripping through that wallpaper with sweat and gritted teeth Where wedding vows and a thousand rows reveal the love underneath And the flamenco Spanish senorita dolls on the mantelpiece Of all but gone except for one which sits inside of me Cheers, thank you Nice one, cheers, thanks very much. Poetry on a Friday night, I bet you can't believe your luck, can you? <laughs> I got a cousin called Gordon. Um, right, gormless bastard, but he's my cousin all the same. Nothing you can do about that. Families, you know. Um, and he got, he's called Gordon, and he got a job as a traffic warden. And I thought, well, there's a poem. <laughs> that is a poem, that, isn't it? But he got this job as a traffic warden and he just, honestly, he went from being a forklift truck driver at Topps Tiles to Mussolini in 48 hours. <laughs> what a knob, honestly. So I wrote this poem about him. 
But it's got like a bit of a twist to it, because he's, anyway. My cousin Gordon, the traffic warden, fires fines from machine struck Gatling gun. He's starkly officious, hardly auspicious, fly poster in windscreens with tickets for fun. He's bereft of any compassion, he's duty bound to browbeat. You think he'd been born in that uniform as he goose steps down the high street. Absolutely autocratic, always ecstatic when a tyre's touching two yellow lines. And with a grin above chin whilst dribbling, he does a foxtrot whilst flinging out fines. Now my cousin Gordon, the traffic warden, he's vile, volatile and venomous. Taking pictures daily, thinks he's David Bailey, snapping offending cars for evidence. And from, now through the church's litany, he had an epiphany. He knelt at the altar and drank from the font. Then my cousin Gordon, the traffic warden, heard God say, let them all part where they want. After seeing the light, he let them part where they like. The tickets and fines were no more. My cousin Gordon, the traffic warden, the shopkeepers and shoppers did truly adore. The sign on the bay. 30 minutes did say but the lady overstayed by two hours she was legally parked but he didn't get nuts she just gave him a kiss and a bouquet of flowers the local authority avoided my majority to have Gordon the traffic warden taken away now if you want to see him he's in Salford Museum they've stuffed him and put him on display <laughs> cheers thank you true story how am I doing for time alright five minutes mm-hmm yeah, yeah, okay. Anybody got hemorrhoids? I know it's not the kind of thing you get asked at a gig, but is there any sufferers? Show of hands, please. Fuck. Just put your fucking hand up. Anyone, just. Unless you're on a day, I can understand, like, you know, first day, you know. Nobody. Just me. This next poem's all about piles. Does anyone know what they are? They're vicious bastards. It's called The Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> Believe it or not, I tweeted this poem once with the title, and this guy kept hassling me about the fact that I knew nothing about the John Steinbeck novel. <laughs> Twitter. So it's about piles, mate. It's called The Grapes of Wrath. I don't do, I do a lot of commissions and I've done some pretty big ones recently, but the ones I choose to do which are right, I won't do nationwide, no, that sort of nonsense, and I won't do any kind of corporate stuff, but I am waiting for Prep H to get in touch, and my missus is in the audience, we can get the kitchen done, because I've got this ready written, this next poem. <laughs> Prep H, if anyone's, anyone works for any kind of anusol or germaloids, you know, you just don't know, do you? So, this is the poem, it's called Grapes of Wrath. And I've got one more after this, and then I'm going to get the hell out of here and let you enjoy a proper cultured evening with Art Malik. No, Art Garfunkel couldn't make it. He's come instead. Now I don't know where they came from or where from they did sprout, but down in my rear for the last 20 years I've had these things hanging out. I've tried a finger, I've tried a fist to try and push them back. I've tried every cream, even red hot steam. And then my mum said, try fiery jack. No, 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 no. You're all Tabasco sauce. No, no, not down there. No, no, no. Just try it when you go home tonight. It might give you a bit of a... I don't know. When me courting first got a little intimate and her roving hands were stirred to touch me beneath, but she went right underneath and she froze like a ghost had appeared. I said, they merely veins draining the territory, the inferior rectal arteries. Well, she puked down my throat and grabbed the coat and swiftly said to her, ah, to me, I long for the day when these are all behind me, just a tea towel holder down below. No constant twitching, no hypnotic itching, no stinging after each time I go. Oh, one night outside York train station, I was scratching away to relax me. It was an absolute farce. I wish I'd wiped my ass before I whistled for that fucking taxi. <laughs> it's not one bit funny. It's no bleeding joke. So please, please don't laugh to no bore pain. And if I could have abstained from the dreaded grapes of wrath, which none of you suffer from. So cheers. Thank you. <laughs> You're all so lucky. I'm probably the only performer to wish hemorrhoids on you, that's all I'm saying. I mean, sometimes I do worry. Why? 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 We're in York. The, 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 oh, God. He said the C word. I'm terribly sorry, but a massive, massive clap off for JB Barrington! <laughs> So here we are live at the beautiful, ornate York Theatre Royal. Everybody, thank you so much for coming out for the Two Shot Podcast live at York Theatre Royal. 
I can't say that enough. Please put your hands together for the legend that is Mr. Art Malik. Wow. Wow. Oh, here we are. Theatre Royal. The Theatre Royal. Have you played the Theatre Royal? Well, we are playing the Theatre yeah, Royal right now, Art, as you can see. It's huge. Huge, vast. There's oh. a lot of excitement in the room. How much excitement is there in the room? <clears throat> You that's, have to articulate in the theatre like do. this. You do. We have to. We'll have to use all our sort of actor prowess, which I don't really like to do. Uh, <laughs> did you ever have that? When there was a time when um, I was uh, younger, and you know, you're, you're, you're at do's, you're at parties, mm. and people would go, "Oh, so what do you do for a living?" I'd go, "Oh, I'm just no, I'm just an actor." Really apologising for what I did. There was one time I got so sick of it. I just went, I just work for British Gas. <laughs> like, genuinely, I would say that, because then the, the conversation would be shut down and I wouldn't need to talk about it. So I, it was like I was embarrassed about yeah. it for a time. I used to say I was a helicopter pilot. Did you really? Yeah. So much sexier. <laughs> well, I thought so. Ever, ever flown a helicopter? No. Ever been in a helicopter? Yes. Have you? Yeah, once. And I did try. I mean, I, I, literally, my, my daughter bought me a, a present, a birthday present, to, uh, to go flying. And my wife came. And what you're supposed to do is, with the joystick, you're supposed to keep the helicopter still, mm. right? But I couldn't do that. I kept doing that. Because I couldn't, just couldn't keep it still, and I was doing that. And my wife, who suffers from terrible travel sickness, she got on, and she just went... And he went, that's amazing. And she said, I want to do what my husband was doing. She said, no, he wasn't doing it right. No, that, yeah, that, that's dangerous. <laughs> yes. There may be fatalities involved. So you got away with that, Clay. I got away. I was talking to a friend of mine um, about an hour before we met. Because here's the thing. I texted um, Art about, I don't know, about half four, five o'clock. Yeah. Just to double check that everything was all right. Because um, who came from Devon? That's where he come from today. Yes. He's come all the way from Devon to the beautiful York Theatre Royal. Um, and um, I, I just want to always want to make sure. Obviously, I'm in touch with JB, and I knew he was here, and that's fine. And I texted Art and said, oh, "When you," <laughs> I actually said, "When you get to York Theatre Royal, <laughs> um, just give me a text, make sure that everything's fine." Ten minutes, nothing. Thirty minutes, nothing. <laughs> 50 minutes, nothing. Now, at this moment, I'm starting to sweat. And I'm thinking, we've got a lovely crowd of people who've come all the way to York to see us. What the fuck am I going to do if Art Malik is stuck on a train and he, uh, he didn't get his phone? Uh, he's here, it's fine. We all, it's all sorted, so I could relax. But I was talking to a friend of mine, and she was saying um, what a huge fan of yours she was. But when she was younger, she was watching Children of the Crown, right? And she, obviously she fell completely in love with you, but she'd never seen a Pakistani actor on the television. And then I was thinking about you, and I was thinking about your influences. Who were you seeing? Well, uh, uh, well at the time, I mean, I suppose the, the people that I saw would be people like Zia Muhyiddin, Tariq Yunus. Um, and what were they doing? Well, they were, they were on television. They were actors, yeah. I mean, they were the, the first sort of wave of actors that played Indians, and they did things like, the, you know, Passage to India in the West End. And the, I mean, Tariq... I remember watching Tariq Yunus in a play at the BBC, a BBC film. Well, they used to call them plays of the day. <laughs> it's just like mini films. And it was called Passage to England, and it was about this man who was just a con artist. Right. And um, it was a wonderful performance. And I saw that and I thought, yeah, I, yes. I mean, you know, one has to understand, I, my father was an eye surgeon. All my brothers were, you know, doctorates and philosophers and brain surgeons. I do, actually. My oldest brother is a brain surgeon. <laughs> and um, so when I decided to give up... Um, 
tertiary education, so to speak, and said to my father, I want to be a, an actor. It, it, was, it was just silence. Obviously. He just had no idea. He, had, he was like, what? I said, I, 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 I want to be an actor. He went, but doing what? I said, you know, plays, Dad. Like, you know, there are plays. And he said, well, I don't. He never went to the theatre. He never watched movies. He never watched television, really. But where did this come from for you? Um, I think it came from a desperation that I knew when I got my 1A level that I was never going to be as good as my brother's. Right. So I thought, what? I think I can do something else. And then I remembered that the best time I ever had was in an inter-house play, which was called The Pen of My Aunt. Right. And I played the aunt. <laughs> and, 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 you know, when you're a 14-year-old boy and you sit down, you sit down. That's what you do. You forget about the fact that women with dresses on tend to do that. You know, keep their legs together. And I, that. Anyway, it was an ho- inter-house competition, and um, th- th- there were four houses, five um, judges. Each one would give four points. So the most you could get was 20. The least you could get was five. We got four. <laughs> <laughs> one of the judges just said, I can't... I know, no, Beta House was dreadful. And as for that, uh, Mr. Malik keeping his legs... At, no. Well, there's many men on London tubes that just sort of sit like that, and I have to sit next to them. It's not nice. They're still doing it now. Can we talk about moving to England? Because am I right in saying you moved when over I was here when three. you were three? I was three, and I this f- was this was for your dad's work, wasn't it? Yes, my father had uh, um, had experienced the um, um, the independence for Pakistan, and uh, he he then left. Um, Bihar, where, we, where he, he was with my, my mother, who was pregnant at the time, and she had a one-year-old. So pregnant with a one-year-old, independence came. They left India to go all the way to Pakistan. And when he got to Pakistan, um, he had... You know, my mother gave um, birth to my second brother, and then there were two others, and then I came along, and at which point my father decided to come to Britain. Right. And I never saw him till I was about three. He came here primarily because he wanted to be an eye surgeon. And that's all he ever wanted to do. He came to Britain. He wanted to be Mr. Malik. And as soon as he became Mr. Malik, he went back to Pakistan. I mean, one has to remember that this was a man born in the 20s. He was somebody who wanted to have a nation that was his. You know, and as we go into Brexit, and what an auspicious day today is. Um, you know, he wanted to have his own rule and determination, and that's what he wanted. He wanted to be an eye surgeon. He came here, he became Mr. Malik, and he went back to Pakistan, leaving and us here. With your dad being away a lot, and you being so young, what, how did that affect your relationship with your dad? Well, it, it's, I mean, I think my father had, had picked up um, parenting um, by the Victorians. You know, he'd, 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 given this, he'd taken this book and said, oh, well, this is how the British do it. Right. Well, basically, what you do is you ignore your children. <laughs> yes, well, that, well, that sounds rather good. So mum does all the cooking and shouting, and I just beat them up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. So we didn't really, I mean, all of us, all us, you know, all six of us really had a very strange relationship with our father because he never really said anything. I mean, I remember, you know, when I was at Guild Hall, when I finally got into Guild Hall, and I was in my final year showing, and, and my father was actually in town, and I said, you know, well, when do you want to come? I said, you know, there's three, four shows, one's on Wednesday, um, you can come Thursday, there's two on Friday, you can come Friday, whatever you want. He said, I'll come Friday evening. Right. So, of course, you know, there, there I was, and I knew exactly, and I'd placed him in a, in a wonderful chair, a seat in the theatre at, the, at Guildhall, because I thought, that's where I'm going to be acting. I'm going to be acting downstage <laughs> left, so I want him to see me. And all I saw was an empty chair. And it wasn't that he had chosen not to come, it just never crossed his mind to actually take that much interest in his children. I mean, he was a wonderful dad. I know that sounds really odd, but he was. He was lovely and all the rest of it. It was just, he he was like, well, do you want to be an actor? Well, good luck. And away you go. Away you go. I'm sure you'll be fine. But that's even 
That makes me even more sad um, that it didn't cross his mind. No, he, he never... He, he told everybody else that he thought I was rather good in Jewel in the Crown. He said, Ra- he's rather, rather good. good. He's rather good. <laughs> he's rather good, yes, yes. But he never said it to me. <laughs> never, no, no, never. It's funny, that, isn't it? Because sometimes you think, oh, God, is this... Is this a generational thing? So I remember years ago, and we know that I never bring this podcast about me, and it's not, but this is a link. Um, I remember years ago, I always thought that my parents would only think I was a success if I was walking down the cobbles in Coronation Street, being from the north, yes. you know, because well, that's what they watch, and it's in the house all the time, so you, you kind of strive to do that, but obviously, I... I can't be in Coronation Street. No, no, he, he, he was... Um, and I don't he, mean that in a disrespect. I'm not that type of actor. That no. is, that's too hard work for me. I mean, I, li- I like no. to just sort of coast by, to be honest. Gosh, sorts of people. <laughs> that would be scary. It's so hard. I couldn't do that. I was talking to... Did everybody hear the Judy Hesmond-Holsch episode? You know, she was doing that for 16 years, playing the, the same character. And... All these different scripts written by so many brilliant, amazing mm. writers, such as uh, Jonathan mm. Harvey writes mm. for uh, Coronation Street. He's an amazing writer. Mm. But it's a different discipline. You know, it's different. It's like when we talk about theatre or we talk about film or we mm. talk about television, they're all completely different. Oh, I know. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. You can be doing a feature film and there's an actor, and I won't mention his name, but... You, know, you we, can, you know, because we can beep it out, <laughs> but it'd be not... I'm just, we, we, we were sort of doing this film and, and there, was an, there was an emotional scene coming up. I can only say that. And uh, everything's set. You know, you know what it's like. You set the cameras up, the lights are all set, everybody's ready to go. They're just waiting for that one word, action. And we're all there. And uh, the first assistant comes up to me because we're just waiting. We're just waiting. And I said, waiting for what? He said, the mood. I said, the mood. The mood. He said, yes, the uh, uh, illustrious actor over there who's just wandering around with his headphones on, waiting for the mood to come. <laughs> it was 20 minutes before that mood came. <laughs> and then that was just take one. We did 22 takes. Oh, my God. I know. I was like... Kill me now. Just um, kill me now. And my mood just left the exit. It's <laughs> yes, gone. I've got, I've, I've got no I've got mood left. <laughs> it's quite selfish, though. It's oh, so selfish I sometimes. I know. But the, you see, I mean, I think the thing is that you have to... I mean, the first time I was ever called a star, somebody said, you know, you're a star. I said, well, that's rat spelt backwards. <laughs> <laughs> that can't possibly be an aspiration for any actor. All you want to do as an actor is, you know, and even now I find it very difficult to talk about acting because I believe that you're, when I'm in the audience, I don't want to know too much about the actor. No. You know, I want, to vote, you know, I want the mystery of the actor and I want my naivety and therefore the play will work, the characters will work. And sometimes that gets a little bit screwed up. Well, I was, it's funny you say, because I was doing an interview on... BBC Radio York. Big up, BBC Radio York. Um, this afternoon when I got here. And um, they were talking about that, about the, the difference. And, and I was saying, well, the reason why when I have actors on the podcast, the, and you were asking me about before about why I started this, the one thing that I never wanted to do with actors was to go through an IMDb page or talk about different jobs because it's part and parcel of what we do. We don't f- the job never finishes for an actor until they do all the press and they're talking about their show and they're selling the show. And that's, it can be boring and it can be narcissistic, I think, sometimes. So I, I, and also, because I'm so curious about people and people's lives, this is much more interesting to me and everybody who listens... Uh, than talking about, you know, that's when I had Vicky on for the first episode. I don't want any This Is England anecdotes. Mm. I want to know about you, and it's much more interesting. I thought it'd be much more accessible, so that was the reason why. Ah, I see, right. Does that well, make I, sense? No, I mean, it, it makes complete sense, because really, um, you know, acting is... I've been very, very lucky, and, 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 you know, and you've done some great work. You know, when, when, when you get a script that's well-written, mm. it makes acting so much easier. Yeah. 
When you're not acting, when you haven't got a great script, you have to rely on your own intelligence and your own words, and that's usually where I fuck up big time. It, 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 when you say, and I know you're kind of half-joking, but I think there's a, a, a nugget of truth in there. What, what do you mean by that? I just mean that, you know, when you have to think about things, when you have to really try to, to ex- express what you're feeling. So when somebody says to you, how do you get into that part? You, you, it's very difficult to talk about because... You know, the idea for for a scene might have come because you were listening to the radio that morning. Mm. There, there must be there might be something that you look at, and you look at somebody and you think, "Well, I like the way he's sitting. Well, that'll be good. Yeah, I'll do that. That's a nice hand, hand movement." You know, so so you're pick, you're constantly as an actor picking things up. Well, and so, so you're constantly listening, yes. and you're constantly looking, yeah. you're trying to steal. And so, so you know, and and very early on in my career, I, I, I mean, literally my second job, I was at Pinewood, and I was working with an actor called um, Hal Galili, and Hal Galili had come over with the original West Side Story, right? You know, and I was I was sharing dressing rooms with Hal, and he was in his fifties, and I was just left drama school, and so I said to Hal, I said, well. How, come on, we've, you know, we're sharing a dressing room. We've been here for about two weeks now. Any advice? Because you've forgotten everything I know, so come on, any advice? And he was, um, he, he was doing his, his crossword. I think it was the Times, I don't know. And he was doing the turn, and he goes, hang on, hang on. And he folds up his paper, and he goes, okay, here it is. You're employed between two words, action and cut. They say action, you do your shit. They say cut, sit down, shut the fuck up, look, listen, and learn. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I thought, three years at drama school, three years at Guildhall, and no one had ever succinctly put it down to that. And of course, listening and and watching is what actors are good at. Yeah. Well, you That's see it all the time. Yes. It's funny because I was about to ask you about advice at some point during our conversation, but we've covered it because that's the best fucking piece of advice I've ever heard. (laughs) Aspiring actors out there, please do take note, everybody that is listening, that that is perfect. Um, Can we talk about moving here and growing up and starting school? How was that for you uh, personally? uh, Well, personally, it was great because... um, Well, all right... uh, for those of you who remember, there was a chap called Idi Amin who kicked out a load of British people. Well, those British people happened to all come from India originally. And he said, well, you're all British, bugger off. Mm. Prior to that, I could tell the most ex- wonderful stories about my life because I was exotic. You know, people say, you're from India. You go, yes. <laughs> I said, I mean, so, so, do you... Do, 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 did do, do, do your family have any elephants? I go, elephants? We've got elephants. <laughs> we have elephants. We have camels. We have, uh, we have my, my mother had runs a harem. You know, I, I, I completely made all this up. I thought, I, I, See, I you thought, started acting before you, knew you wanted to be an actor. I know. I thought, well, if you're going to, you know, if I'm exotic, I will be exotic. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, then there was the influx. And... and it was at that moment that suddenly there was the National Front. It was at that moment that you suddenly realised, oh, being a Pakistani isn't what you are. Actually, what you are is you're, you're referred to as a Paki, oh. which I always found rather strange. I would say, no, Pakistani. <laughs> no, they're, they're, it's, it's just, if you just use those other two syllables, it's such a nicer word. And, you know, and then run. <laughs> I learned to run, you know, when we had the uh, National Front and things. But those, that was that time. I think what was one grew up in a, a, a Britain that had an empire, had had an empire. Yeah. It was a Britain that had just come out of two world wars. And it was aching, and it was bruised, and it was hurting, and it, and it was trying to put everything together. I mean, racism didn't exist in my street. Nobody who put their hands on my shoulder was a racist. Because uh, the racism was over there. And then when you did meet a racist, you could sort of say, well, is it just what my, the color of my skin? That's, that's what you're up. Yeah. Well, let's go out and get tanned together. Right. I can't bleach, but you can tan. Did you encounter that? Did you and your family encounter that? Yes. Oh, God, yes. I mean, I used to get... What year are we talking? Oh, we're talking, I mean, when I was about 10, so that's 62. 
I remember when I was 63, I mean, my father had decided to send us to this school, which is a private school called Coombe House. It was, it was rather good. And um, Where was that? He, well, it was in, it was in um, uh, a place called New Malden, which is very near Kingston in Surrey. Right, okay, yeah. And, um, and in the summer, of course, we had to wear boaters. Well, I don't think my father really understood that when he sent us off from school in Ballam to go by train to Clapham Junction, to get, you know, and Clapham Junction was rough. You know, and you'd be there, my brother and I were sitting there with our boaters. You know, little <laughs> going, you know, we're off to school. And, and kids would come up and go, things like, you beat my brother up. I go, I, 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 I don't think I know your brother. He goes, yes, you do. You, you, you took the piss out of him because he was an albino. Because oh, he's got pink eyes and blonde hair. And I was going, and I looked at my brother and I said, no, we don't know anybody. Who, no, we don't know any albinos. We don't know any albinos. What are you talking about? And, of course, it was that point that the first punch came. And you realized that this was, this was a strange place to be. A comfortable place. It's a very uncomfortable, but you know, there were enough people around to tell you, no, that's not what we are. Mm. That is not who we are. Within your community. Within our community. I mean, yes, I can understand the, the anguish. I mean, if one talks about what happened yesterday on the underground in London, I can understand the anguish. If yeah. you're on a zero hours contract, and, you're, and you know, London is now. It takes most people an hour and a half to get to work. You know, so you can understand their frustration with all these people talking about the world and the planets, mm. you know, re in, uh, rebellion and extinction. I can get, I understand that. But the violence that we see, that's what's starting to frighten me more because you start thinking, no, 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 no. You know, we have, the, the, we have this wonderful language that we can use to express how we feel about things. We do not need to get to violence. I mean, that was... That was... I mean, case in point with yesterday, I mean, that was pack mentality. Yes. I mean, it was... I was so shocked to see it. But saying that, the ball's on that fella because he did it in Canning Town, which is really fucking rough. And he was, I don't know what he was thinking, to be honest. Um, what was, she, I mean, your mum was looking after a big family. Yeah, she was 16 away. when she got married. She was 16? Yeah, she got married when she was 16. She was married when she was 16. She was, she was a mother at 17. She was pregnant at 18. She had... Um, she was leaving Bihar, Patna in India. Um, most people were going um, by train through Lucknow into Pakistan. My father had decided wisely that wasn't the route to go because so many people were, were killing each other. Mm. He decided to go to uh, Mumbai as it is now, Bombay as it was then, and get the boat up to Karachi and arrive at Karachi and sort of go up to somebody and say, I'm a doctor, where do you want me? Um, it was... It was it was a difficult journey that he made. You know, that journey that he made was to, to get away from the, the sudden realisation that, you know, that the end of the empire, what it had created, all it had created was this, was this animosity between Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs, yeah. which 250 years prior to it, th there probably was a lot of interstate rivalry, but there was nothing that matched what happened in 1946 to 48. Um, did, your mum didn't know anybody ever here, did she? She didn't know anybody. She, How did she And she would, would, and she, people would say to her things like, you know, uh, Mrs. Malik, you know, you really, you really shouldn't have to wear saris, you should wear trousers. Oh, really? You know, so, what about the you know, you know, I mean, I just don't understand, you know. And mum would be wearing her sari and things, and you know, and then in the rain, and she just hooked the sari up a bit so that it didn't absorb all the water. And people were saying, you know, saris, it's raining. And she goes, we have the monsoons. <laughs> 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 it's all right, rain, I'm used to it. But she didn't, no, she didn't speak a word of English. Uh, she learnt, she learnt how to look after her children. We didn't have a lot of money. She spent most of the time, she had children, you know, she had six children by mm. then. I was number five, my sister was number six. 
And she spent all the time sewing and, and knitting and everything, you know. And so I would look at my, my eldest brother and think, nice, nice jumper. <laughs> I'll get that in five years. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. I finally he's got the other way around for me because he used to go, oh, Jesus, now I'm going to have to wear that in like three years. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, of course, they were the ones that you saw. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So, very academic family. Very. What went wrong? <laughs> Dyslexia, I suppose, is, is one thing. Well, Although, that's I'm, interesting. That's exactly yes. where I was coming. You yes. read my mind. Because yes. my little boy is not dyslexic. But people who listen to the podcast know that I sometimes talk about him. Um, he is dyspraxic. So he's, you know, we're still working on the catching the ball thing, but he's doing very mm. well in the handwriting. It's just all about the fluid mm. movements. Um, when were you diagnosed? Well, I wasn't. Ah. There was no diagnosis for dyslexia. You were just stupid. You were the one at the back. It was, you know, I mean, I mean you know, my, the, the, the maths master couldn't understand. I mean, my brother went on to do a PhD in pure maths and he's a fantastic mathematician. I couldn't get it. And he would just look at me and say, Malik, what's the problem? Mm. Your brother's so good. So you were branded and that was stupid it. And, and that was it. lazy. Yes, and you were branded or, yeah. as stupid, you were lazy, you couldn't read. I mean, you know, my dyslexia had this, and a lot of people have it, which is you... you, you it's not good having black writing on white paper. No. That can put me to sleep really quickly. Mm. So I, when I read scripts, I kind of put dark glasses on right. so that I don't go to sleep. Well, it just helps. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's so interesting that yeah. I, I know so many actors yeah. who are dyslexic. Mm. And I don't know if you know, but sometimes when... Um, actors are given auditions, they're sometimes, more and more so now over the few years, I don't know if you find this, they're given um, audition sides and scripts to go and meet the director or put on a self-tape. Sometimes you, you've got 24 hours and you've got maybe 12 pages of dialogue to do and there's no care or thought put into this at all. You just think, well, everybody can just read it and learn it. But it's not that. People well, uh, yeah, need time. There, there, was, there was a time when, we, when I started out and nobody would, you know, when you went for f films and things, I mean, my, my audition for, or if, if you could call it an audition, with David Lean for... Um, passage to India. Which was, we'll get to. Which we'll get to. But this was, you know, this was his. I mean, I went up and there he was staying in, in this fabulous hotel called the Berkeley in London. And he had this suite with a terrace on it. And he looked at me and he went, he went oh, could you look that way? Could you look that way? Come and have a look at the terrace. He showed me the terrace and showed me where he was going to put some plants and how wonderful it was and all the rest of it. And then he turned around to, um, he said, what do you think of the script? I said, well, I haven't seen a script. And he turned around to Priscilla John, who was the casting director at the time, and sort of said, Priscilla, how, what is the point of Mr. Malik coming here if he hasn't read a script? So there was a different way of, of dealing with things. The problem today is, is that it's not David Lean who yeah. has the chance. It's, there is a, an army of people... So when you do those audition tapes, it's not the director that has the say. It's not the writer. There's usually some executive somewhere further down the line who sits there and goes, well, yeah, it was all right. Yeah, it was all right. But he didn't know the words. Mm. And you go, but he, he is an actor of note. He will remember the lines come yeah. the day. Yeah. You know, what you're looking at is, is he something that you want to work with? Is this a person that you want to be with? And so we're, we're in a different... And, and, then, and then, you know, I remember the days when people would say, you know, D do you mind reading? And you go, can you read? And I go, well, of course I can read. <laughs> what do you want me to do? And they give you some papers, and then you'd sit there and you'd read the scene. Well, you don't have that now. Now people want you to perform. And you're performing against what? Mm. Well, nothing. nothing. And it, it used to be that point of going, right, so I'll go into the room, and this is a starting point. Mm. When we start filming, we're going to be there, but I'm going to start here. I'm going to show you something 
of what I think we can try and get to. But also, if we're talking about and we're going to meet in the room, then you'll get a bit of flavour of me. You'll get to know who I am and what I'm like as a person. Because I always say, and I get so many um, uh, sort of messages and emails from younger actors, and I'm a mentor and a, a young lad who's just graduated from Central at the moment. And I always say, if you're in an audition room, just remember it's, it's a two-way thing here. You're going to be working with somebody for however long. What if they turn out to be the idiot? You've got to carry on working with them. That's really hard for you to do your job. So it's as mu- the audition process is as much about uh, you as it is about them. And that's all gone with the self-tape. And I remember talking to Amanda Abington about this, and she was so angry about that it's just turned into a line-learning contest. It's just- it is, and, Which, and if it's about line learning, then, you know, that's... It's, it's very difficult to talk about it because the thing is that, you know, we've become such an international world. Um, you know, a script could, could be given the green light in Los Angeles and then they're looking for actors not only in Los Angeles, London, Australia, mm. England, of mm. course. They're, 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 they're casting everywhere. And so... But when you get, this is the interesting thing, when, when they ask actors to do, say, you know, well, here's five scenes, you know, and there's 20 pages here, could you just learn those, put them on tape and come in in two days' time and, and, uh, and audition for it? There's a part of you that thinks, why would you want to do that? Because there's no way you're going to be looking at 20 pages of your performance, mm. the next performance, or the 30 other actors that are up for the part. You're just going to immediately, if, if I know anything about directors and producers, they'll put the tape on, they'll look at it, and they'll go, perfect. Yeah. And exactly. that poor actor and all the other actors have spent days learning this stuff, which is usually not very good. Well, that's well it isn't, because it's all got to be rewritten. You know, they, and also the fact that you've got to learn those 20 pages of not great writing no. is really hard to get no, no, in your brain because bad writing yeah. doesn't go in because no. you can't connect with it. <laughs> I know Hugh, Hugh Bonneville d- does... Uh, d- 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 am I allowed to talk about Catch that? Catch that one? <laughs> Hugh Bonneville, Dancing Hugh Abbey. Bonneville. Many more coming. We haven't even got to Schwarzenegger. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> Hugh... Hugh. Hugh does his Fun. own. Hugh does his his self taping at home, and, he, and 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 I, we were talking about this, you know, having to learn all these lines. He goes, "Well, what do you do that for?" And I said, "Well, you've got to learn the lines." He goes, "No, he self tapes. He puts the camera there. He he literally just, you know, takes a selfie of himself and all the words around his kitchen." So he's doing this and he's reading all the words. <laughs> and it looks fantastic, really? doesn't it? Because everybody thinks, oh my God, he's so good. Right, Hugh Bonneville's coming on. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just be an hour of audition technique masterclass <laughs> with Bonneville. I'll sell out yes. the York Theatre Royal once again. <laughs> um... Can we talk while we're on? I mean, we're st- we bounce all around on this podcast art, as you know. Um, I want to talk about childhood and big family. Yes. Happy family? Um, very difficult, very difficult, because, you know, my father's decision to come to Britain was actually only to become... Um, from being Dr. Malik, he just wanted to be Mr. Malik. Mm. That was it. As soon as he became Mr. Malik, he buggered off. But at the same time he was doing that, he wanted us to know where it was we were coming, f- not only coming from, but where we were going back to. So just like, uh, you know, when I went to say, when, uh, if I go and live in Los Angeles or do a job in Los Angeles, I might take the family with me, but I'm thinking of coming back to England. Right. So his thing wasn't about settling here. He came here to get this FRCS because Pakistan didn't have a medical school at that time. I mean, by medical school, I mean a school of medicine that you can then say, oh, these are the, um, you know, these are the surgeons, these are the fellows that come from, from this school of medicine. Pakistan actually got its school of medicine in about 1962. Well, my father came here to do that, and at the same time, he sent us back. So my... Uh, eldest brother was sent back to Pakistan 
I was three, he was eight. He was sent back to Pakistan at eight to right. a boarding school. I was sent back to the same boarding school when I was nine to, to a, a, an English boarding school in Quetta, which is right on the border with Afghanistan. And, um, Were you by yourself at this point? No, I, I, no I went back with two of my brothers. Yeah. Only two? Where were Only the two. The others had gone on to right. other schools by then. Um, but it was very weird. It was very weird because you'd be at Heathrow Airport just getting on a, you know, and Heathrow Airport was a tiny little airport then. And, you know, you, you, you'd see cousins coming over from there to go to British public schools. And we were being sent to a British public school on the border of Afghanistan. How did you find that at nine years old? Scary. Lonely. Seriously scary. Lonely. Scary, lonely. Um, there was... Uh, you know, it was a boarding school. You got to know what boys wanted. And, um, and being a young boy, it, it wasn't very pleasant. I, want, I don't need to go into details, but it was, it was horrible. Yeah. And you, had a, you have a close relationship with your mum? Because then you're, um, you're not but, with Well, I, I, was, I was out of all the, all the five boys. My, my sister didn't go. Of all of us that went back, I was the one that only did a year. Everybody else did a lot. I mean, my eldest brother never came home. He stayed in Pakistan, yeah, he went to Pakistan, he went to medical school in Pakistan, graduated, um, and my father was, was seriously upset with him because he wanted to become a neurosurgeon. And um, he decided that he was going to go on the intern program in America. So he graduated from Pakistan, came to England, which my father thought, well, now that you're here, you know, you, you, you too can become Mr. Malik. And he didn't want to be Mr. Malik. He just wanted to go to America because he felt that this wasn't the place that he wanted to be. And around that time, you know, we are talking about the NFF, uh, you know, the National yeah. Front, yeah. constantly being referred to as a Paki and being told to go home, which was rather extraordinary, really, because you think, well, I don't know where home is. Did your mum cope with this at the time? Um, I think my mum was cushioned by the fact that she never really left home. You know, she never went out. She'd go down to the shops. She'd go and do some cert. You know, but also the things was that what she wanted from the shops, she couldn't really get. So she would, you know, she, I mean, we were... I remember the first Asian corner shop that arrived in Balham. Mm. I mean, there was great rejoicing, you know, because suddenly she didn't have to wait for all those spices and yeah. things to come from Pakistan so she could cook. She could actually walk in, you know, because if you went into Tesco's at that time and said, I want some cardamoms, you're what? Sorry. <laughs> so, so, they was, so, so she suddenly went, yes, this, this is now getting better. And there was a part of, you know, when, when the East African Asians arrived, there was a great sudden um, awareness of who these people were. Do you think she felt slightly like a prisoner at certain times? I think she felt like a prisoner all her life. Really? Um, well, but, you know, I mean, if you're, six, if you're 14 and... I mean, I remember my mother went... To, she went one day to school when she was 12. She loved it. She absolutely loved going to that school. It was because there was a girl next door, a Hindu family... And they'd taken her. But when she came back, my grandfather just basically um, tore her to shreds and said, you're never to leave this house again. You do not need to learn. You do not need to learn to write. You don't need to do anything. You need to do what your, your mother's doing. Well, of course, you know, when, you know that, that's, that's part of her growing up. Her growing up was getting up in the morning and, and you know, taking wheat and grinding it to make the flour mm. and grinding seeds and going and picking things up and sowing things. I mean, that was what she did until somebody turned around and said, you're marrying this man. And in came my dad. But she obviously craved education. She craved education. She loved education. She couldn't believe when she got here that she could do evening classes. Wow. Yeah, she thought that was amazing. I mean, she always said to us, you know, that, that, that was the one thing both of them had said, is that whatever you do in life, educate. 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 But it's, we're always learning. I mean, yeah, whenever I talk to actors on the podcast, what keeps them going 
apart from being endlessly fascinated and curious mm. about people, is that from job to job, you're making a whole new family and you're learning. You, it just doesn't stop. And you see those people who walk in, who go, no, it all, it's fine. They're, they're not learning. So therefore, go and do something else. Yeah. If you don't strive to learn and be educated, go and do something else. I mean, you know, you, you, you start off your career and, of course, you want to, you know, everybody wants, as a young actor, you want, you want to play Romeo. Every young actress wants to play Juliet. No, never. <laughs> Can you see me as Romeo? Yes. In fact, we could... <laughs> For those listening at home, I'm just pointing at the royal box of the York Theatre Royal. <laughs> Sorry, Art. Go on. You know, you, you start off and you want to play the big parts and you want, you, you, you want to be on that stage all the time. Mm. Um, and then you realise, actually, that being on the stage in, in an ensemble requires a real dedication because what you have to do as an actor is you, you're telling the audience where to look. So if I'm looking at you, anybody looking at me is now going to look at you. And that's what you do as an actor. And so therefore when you're not playing a part that's speaking, actors find that really odd because they go, well, how do I get people to look at me? And you mm. go, well, maybe they shouldn't be looking at you at this <laughs> moment. You know, how about letting them look at... You know, help them. So it's, it's very difficult, you know. Let's talk about... So you lasted one year. Did you ask to leave that boarding school? No. No, it no, was no, just... no, 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 nothing. I think my mum put her foot down. She wanted her family back. So your mum had oh, a yeah, say? Oh, yeah, because she'd said to my dad, she said, well, she didn't say anything to my dad. You didn't talk to my dad like that. She... Um, She'd been left, Dad had come over here to get his diploma of ophthalmology, which the Pakistani government had allowed him to do. Once he'd got that, he realised actually it wasn't worth anything. What he needed was to become a fellow of the Royal College. And that meant that he had to stay. Having said that he was going to stay, the hospital that, where we were living, we were told, well, you have to leave. Mm. So my uncle decided that the best thing to do was to leave dad to get his FRCS. He didn't need to be surrounded by his five sons and his wife, um, that she should come and live with them. So we all then went to live with my uncle. And I think my mother decided enough is enough. And she borrowed money off some friends and bought the tickets to put us all on a boat and arrive in Southampton. Yeah, she just wrote a letter to him saying, by the time you get this letter, I'll be at Southampton. No way. Yeah. So she arrived. I mean, I was, I, was, uh, I was three. I was the youngest. She took, she took a cabin um, in a boat on the ship, sorry, in the ship, um, that was right down at the bottom, sort of in the middle somewhere. So we, couldn't, we didn't see anything. Well, I can not remember any of it. But I do know that what she did was that whenever she went out, she locked us all in the room. <laughs> She looked just all in the cafe, yeah. Because she thought, well, at least they're not going to go anywhere. That's true. Yeah. You know, so well, she went to it. And once in a while, we were taken out and aired, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and then we arrived in England, and so that was it. So when she arrived, Dad had to give up his sort of, you know, that bohemian life that he was living in Bloomsbury and get a house, which he had to do. And... Um, then, you know, slowly we were sent back one at a time. And then she suddenly thought, I've just bought my boys to live with you and you've just sent them back and this is not right. Yeah. So I think something must have happened because then we were all brought back, except my eldest brother. But she certainly had a say, even though she wasn't educated, she had a balls. Listen, she had a if, passion. Yeah, but if Dad wanted good food... He had to keep on her good side. Right. She was a, she's a great cook. Still now, phenomenal. Still. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, she doesn't now because she's in her 80s, but, I mean, my God, that woman can cook. I mean, that's where I've learned how to cook from, just watching her. And we all know it all starts in the kitchen. Yeah. Right? And that was the other thing. Growing up, you realised, actually, 
from, <laughs> well, I did, that you could go into the front room where my father was with all the other uncles and all these men who would pontificate. Yeah, you know, in that. Well, I think, well, of course, I think it's what you want. They'd be doing all this. It was dull, boring. You'd go into the kitchen. Oh, my God, the wives were all... And they were all talking about the men in the front room. <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't being nice. <laughs> but it just made me think, I'd much rather stay here. And it needs to be said. Yeah. Those conversations <laughs> need to happen. Oh, yeah. They're having a lot more fun in the kitchen. Exactly. No. Um, leaving school, you touched before on one. O level? A level. One A level. Right. One A level. And then my father decided that uh, I needed to go back to school to do some more. And I decided I didn't want to do that. And I looked up this course which was called business studies you could get higher national diploma in business mm. studies and you can go to this technical college in Twickenham and I went to Twickenham and I signed on to do this HND in business studies I went to two lectures I became president of the students union and I discovered women ah the foil well, just suddenly, the, the, the sheer joy of listening to a different point of view, you know, which was so, so liberating for me. Um, and I decided also at that place to join the drama department. Where, did, where did this come from? Because we haven't, it hasn't come out, the drama, yet. So why, what was that moment of realisation? Sue Preston. God. There we go. Well, she was in the drama. She was going to be doing this play, and I... I repeat again, the foil. The foil. And I just, you know, and we, we, we were together for a very long time. Thank you very much. And it was lovely. And um, she... It was there that I started to get involved in the drama, and, and, you know, and it was all agitprop. It was the 70s, you know, we were doing sort of meaningful theatre about politics and the way things are and, you know, f feminism and, and racism and all mm. this stuff, agitprop theatre. And I was really into it. And that's when Frank Cooper, who was one of the lecturers at, at Twickenham, just turned around to me one day and said, um, here, Hamlet speech. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Right. And I went, what are we doing, Hamlet? And he went, no, you're going to learn that and you're going to go up to a drama school. That is so funny. The amount of times that I always say to people, especially when it's actors, all, all, <coughs> obviously when it's only actors on here, it's just that one person. It's just that it's one. that one person who yeah. does something and completely opens the door and says, right, and it might be as strict as you like, and you might not know in your no. own mind what's going and on. And I, I had no idea. You see, the, 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 and in those days, you had, to have to, you had to have a modern speech, and you had to have a classical speech. Mm. That wasn't the problem. The problem was the song. That's they the wanted problem. a song. Well, there was only one song I knew really well, and that was the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> you so, didn't. I did. <laughs> I did. I always go down the Rex Harrison route of speaky song. Speaky song. <laughs> speaky song. You play the piano, just do speaky song. I'll, I'll do some acting that make you think I'm singing. Actually, I'll be five minutes. That, I speak it. I'm singing. It's mystical. Uh, yes, I wish I'd done that. So what happened then? Hamlet, I, Hamlet you started to audition. I, I, went, I went to... Um, well, the first one was about three weeks later, and I wasn't, very, I wasn't ready. For three weeks? Yeah, it was three weeks after that that I did my first audition at I Bristol. I think you put your expectations too high I know, there, I know, I know. I mean, needs... you're brilliant and all that, oh, but no, three no, weeks? No, not then. No. So, so I arrived at the Bristol Old Vic to do my audition. Right. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, uh, Hamlet. And they said, oh, very good, very good. And I, I, said, um, I said, do you, excuse me, I haven't learnt this, so I'll just... Um, so I picked up the... <laughs> <laughs> I know, oh. I know. There's all even them are going <laughs> on. They even know that's wrong. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was oh, like did you? <laughs> look at him. He's got his eyes covered over. Oh, look. So, so I did it, and then and then they said, and have you learnt your modern speech? I said, no, actually not. But I'll do that as well if you want. <laughs> and then I did that. At which point they went, and do you have a song? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> Well, I got, I got two lines out of the National Anthem, and they said, thank you. 
Did and you feel it went well? <laughs> <laughs> well, a year later, I then tried again. Oh, did you? Yeah. And not, then I tried... Um, guilt. I'll be with you in a minute. Uh, <laughs> York Theatre Royal yeah, Arthur, yeah. out for us tonight. Unbelievable. Um, and then I tried, at, I tried for RADA, I tried for Guildhall, and um, I, I But you'd learnt your lesson in... I, I, I had, I had yeah. learnt. I learnt to learn the lines. Rule number one, I was told. Well, always. Yeah. Well, that and turn up on time and... Yeah. As Cathy Burke <laughs> says, don't be a cunt. <laughs> And don't let your breath stink. That's Kathy Burke. That's not me. And you know what? She's, She's very right. right. Because yeah. nobody messes with Kathy Burke. No. Um, at this point, you must have spoken to your mother and father and said, obviously you wouldn't have said it like this, but hey, guess what? I'm going to be an actor. Because I'm dying to know <laughs> what your, your your dad would have said when you. Oh no! You see, dad was re- dad was one of these people. I realised that what all my brothers had done was they'd they'd upped his expectations or they'd upped their expectations in his eyes. So they because would, of their success. Yes. Well, they would turn around. They you know when he said you know well, which university are you going to they 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 would say you know well Oxford. I'm thinking of going to, you know, this college or, or, or that college or this. And, you know, and, 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 so I suddenly thought, my father knows nothing about drama schools. <laughs> so I went to him and I said, Dad, I've just been accepted at the Guildhall. Ah. And he went, what? I said, <sighs> I said, you have to understand, Father. Um, <clears throat> That there are only f- that there are only five major drama schools on the planet, and the Guildhall is the number one. <laughs> you said the Guildhall. The Guildhall. Well, everybody was talking about the RSC, you know, and, and so I thought I'd say to the Guildhall. Which is funny because it is a really prestigious drama oh, no. school. It's really good. <laughs> so he just sort of went, oh, oh right. Well, I suppose you better go then. I went, thank you very much. <laughs> but did you think at that... M- how old oh, were no, you? No, no, hang on. Now, 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 prior to getting into Guildhall, you had to go... No, this is, be- this is the best way. Right. You had to go and do an audition at the London County Council, the GLC. Uh, prior to that, it was called the LCC. Which right. is for your grant. For your grant, for the money, to, so that you could go. Which obviously now don't exist. Right. Oh, We've no, all done don't. it. Yes. So you go. So there I, I go up to um, what was then the, 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 you know, the county hall, and I go into this room, and there's this man in the corner. He's, he's a big major something. Hello. Yes, what are you going to do? a lady sitting over this side, another man over this side, but no, no they, they really weren't of any import, as far as he was concerned. Mm. And he said, oh, well, okay, what are you going to do? Hamlet. So I started my Hamlet, and I finished it, and he went, it's very good. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. You'd learn to, though. Yes, I'd learn yeah, to. Yeah, he's, he's very good. He's very good, isn't he? I mean, he's not guttural. I mean, he's not like those blacks. I mean, yes, uh, he's not like those blacks. He's know. not like those blacks. Not like those blacks, you know, that have guttural problems, you know, the, uh, the theatre problems. I mean, he's very good. I mean, you could play Spanish, <laughs> Italians. I mean, naturally, you could play Indians. Yes, I think that's yes, rather good. That was my ground. <laughs> And these, the, the, these were the people that were dishing out money for the younger generation to train to be an actor. At that time. So that was it, you know, that was 1973. And I went to drama school in 1974. That was it. And that was it. That Did was you... it, that was it. And that's when I realised that, that there is no part that is not available to any actor. If you want to tell somebody a story, you can tell it. If you and I decided to suddenly say here, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to do a play at the Theatre Royal in York where you and I are going to play what? 
It Let's could, play. It could Let's, happen, Art. The you know, night is young. We could do anything we want. We could do anything we want. We could convince you that we're animals. We can convince you that we're women. We can convince you of anything as long as you want us to perform for your liking. And if you want us to perform, we will perform and you will enjoy it. And that's all it is. And that's what I learned at drama school. Nothing wasn't available. I didn't look at any part and think, oh, that's a... That's, that's going to be a problem. Because we were, doing sh- we were doing Chekhov at college. Well, nobody was Russian. No, exactly. You know, and, uh, and in those days, actually, we, we were taught how to speak with Russian accents, so you only could do Chekhov if you had a Russian accent. And thankfully, they suddenly decided, actually, it doesn't matter, it's the words. And, that did. and, and, and this, is actually, <laughs> this is actually a translation of Russian, so we're actually speaking English, so why don't we just speak English? Um, and so it, 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 I, I looked at the world and I thought, yeah, this is, this is where we're going. And it was, it was, you know, it was, it, it was exciting. And it was, we, we were in the 70s and it was like, yeah, we can do this. We can tell stories. It's so incredible that that was instilled in you in that time. Yeah. That the door was open to... The door's a, a, a myriad of possibilities. Yeah. It's fine. It's all going to be fine. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, I think close, the, the doors are shutting, you know. It's, yeah, but that's not for you. Yeah. And there's a class thing. Mm, well, that's not for you. Yeah. But why can't we just go back to well, I, I do. everything could be open, especially for the younger generation of actors now who find it so hard because they're constantly knocking on the door yeah. and no one's there. And they want you to be, you know, I mean, there is this, you made this, this wonderful conversation that people used to have around that time, which was, you know, are you a method actor? Mm. And you go, method? Oh, wow, that's interesting. What, be the person? And they go, yeah. And once I, I, I did an interview once and somebody said, so are you a method actor? And I went, well, I played a serial killer and... Um, <laughs> After the third killing, I think I'd got it. <laughs> you know, and you just think, it's just acting. That's all we do. We just pretend, you know. And if we can pretend well, then people believe it. And they really do. You know, because they do. They do. Because, you, you know, if you, play, if, you, if you play somebody who's lovely, like in, in Jewel in the Crown, I mean, I would have taken Harry Kamar home because of what... what that nasty Mr. Merrick had done to him. Look, let's face it, I think there's many, many people that would love to have taken <laughs> My mum especially, but that's another story. Um, was it a happy time at drama school? Because we all know that three years... I mean, in some respects, I think it flies by. It flew by, it created a great unit, and I'm, I'm with, you know, the, the, the friends that I made at drama school are still there. They're almost some of my closest friends. I mean, one of them is actually my wife. This um, is true. This is true, <laughs> yes. And um, so, but what came out of that, what came out of that was a, a realisation that by the time we got to year three, there was a realisation, hang on, this, we're supposed to be doing this for a job. We need to work when we leave here. It's all great playing here. So what we decided to do in our final year was we decided that there were certain plays that we wouldn't do. There were certain directors that they had been forced upon us and foisted on us in the first year and the second year who weren't very good. Mm. And so we chose not to do those. We chose to be very democratic in the way that we said, okay, so you're going to be the lead in this play. Well, if you're going to be the lead in this play, Craig, people need to come and see you. Right. And I've got a very small part. So my job, while you're doing the play, is to go out there and meet casting directors and sell you. So we all became agents for ourselves. Wow. So we created what was, you know, we, we, would, we would have, we created a sort of mini a mini spotlight, and spotlight is this sort of casting directory with, full of photographs of actors. With, so we created this, because we said, well, you know, the, there was, in spotlight, you were either a juve or you were a leading actor, mm. or you were a character actor, and we didn't know what we were. We just knew we were just leaving drama school. So we supported each other, and, and what happened at the end of that year was that everybody had an agent. 
Wow. At the end of that year. So you, you created know, a supportive network. A supportive just network. Just by yourself, just as students. Just by ourselves. Yeah. I mean, that is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that initiative should be brought into drama schools now and, and passed down yes. from, from the tutors. Yeah. And the thing was to sort of say, you know, we need to find out what this profession is about because we don't know. You're, not, you're teaching us how to act. You're, te- you're giving us great skills. But one of the things we need to know is, what do you do when you walk into a room with a director? Well, what, yeah. are, what are you supposed to mm. say? Was that taught Yeah, to you? not really. There was one, one actress who came in and sort of taught all the young actresses, you know, she said, look, darlings, when you go in and you meet a director, look at them as if you want to fuck them. <laughs> That's all you have to do, just look at them. Put that, I want to fuck you, look. And you say, what? Are you nuts? You know, and of course, you know, you, know, the, you can imagine, can't you, the little Harvey Weinstein sitting there thinking, oh, I'll, I'll go with that. I mean, it's a thing. I mean, I'll give well, it a go in a few weeks in and see if it works. I mean, no, I don't know if I'm up for that, to be honest. What ludicrous advice. Absolutely ludicrous. Absolutely. Then there was the other one, which was never ask questions. What? Yeah. You are joking me. No, oh never ask. Oh, my asked. God. I mean, I, you know, I would, when, I, when I... OK, here we go. This is the big one. The, the Bond film. So I'm, I'm going up for the Bond film. <sighs> Living daylight, and I'm thinking, okay, so I walk in, and there they all are. And, you know, now we have NDAs. We have these things. We're not allowed to tell people what we're doing. We're not allowed to talk about things. In those days, they would just say, don't tell anybody what's in the script. You go, oh, yeah, all right. The old school NDA. Okay, cubby, you're on. I won't tell anybody. Yeah. But prior to that, I'd gone in to meet them, and they were sat there and going, hey, jewel in the ground great and you go and they go where we get? and then i said um could, could i read a script and they went oh yeah when it's ready so i went home you know and on the way home i rang my agent he said how did it go i said it's fine it's cubby's lovely what a wonderful bunch of people and um uh, uh, the, 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 they were talking about it and i said could i read the script and my agent went you what you did what I said, I asked to see a script. Oh, God, oh, don't do that. He goes, what is wrong with asking for a script? Oh, my God. Or you know, so there, was, so there was a, a real, you know, it, it, sort of as if actors were these, these things that you opened a drawer and took one out and went, hmm, no. Yeah, uh, too tall. Oh, nice. Yeah, let's see if that one can work. And whereas I, I always believe... You know, there are credits that go on on those films. If you watch a film or watch anything, there are so many credits. Even when you come to this wonderful theatre and pick up a programme, there are so many people who work in here, so many people who work backstage, making this work. And it's not just about you, the actor. And so, therefore, to me, it was about... This is, this is a journey we're all going on, isn't it? And also we're all part of a team. Yes. Everybody has, I always tell people, everybody has their own job to do within the canon of yeah. this work, of this film yeah. or this television. I mean, I, I, you know, when I, when I'm very fortunate. I'm in a sort of position where, you know, if you're, if you're asked to do a job, a driver will come to the house to take you to work. When you get to work, there'll be somebody who'll be there saying, you know, do you want to have a cup of tea? Do you, and they will show you where your dressing room is. They will show you where makeup is. They will show you where wardrobe is. Well, they will do this every day until you actually point out to Nanny and say, I know what I'm doing now. It's yeah. okay. I'm all right. But there is this idea that somehow, you know, because you've got this, all these people running around after you, that somehow you're that much more important. Well, you're not. No. You know, you, going back to what Hal says, there are two words that you do your work in. After that, you do sit down and watch and listen because when they do go again, it's invariably nothing to do with the actors. It's to do with the cameraman, you know, because you forget that the cameraman wants to do a better job. The sound man wants to do a better job. There's a lighting tweak. There's a lighting tweak. There's loads of reasons, you know, that everybody's trying to get that perfect take. And just that that moment of a take, 
which is, which is what they want. You know, and so when I get picked up by a driver and I always go, you know, hi, what's your name? And they look at me and they go, um, Jeff, Mr. Manic. And I go, A, Jeff, I'm Art. And B, let's get this straight. You are at the top of the pyramid at this moment. If we get caught up, if we are late getting to the studio, no one's going to ring my phone. No. They're going to ring yours. They're going to say, where are you? I said, so, you know, I know where, where I'm asked to work. And I think if you, if you keep that level of humility and just be aware of what it is that we do, which is only we only act. Everybody else around us makes it so much easier. Have you always been like that? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Even at, when fame came and it was a massive sucker punch, which, you know, things like Jewel in the Crown was. Yeah, it's very, the... You see people, and I'm sure you have as well, you see people who you may have worked with at a certain period in your life and then all of a sudden this fame just takes them to another level yeah. and... You think the oh, way yeah. What, oh, what happened to you're not the mm. and I always think I don't blame them actually. I blame the other people who don't tell them to keep these on the floor yeah. and by doing things and practicing what you've just spoken about. Well, I mean, you know, you, you know, you know, Mrs. Malik. I mean, Gina is is you know somebody. I do know his wife. <laughs> I mean, She'll you know, sort him right out of these steps of our line. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, I do remember coming back off a shoot, and I came back, and I, I was so tired. I was really tired. Don't blame tiredness, Malik. Don't no, blame I was tiredness. So tired, and I came back, and I sort of sat down in the kitchen. And <sighs> she said, "How's it going?" Any chance of a cup of tea, love? And she went. She went. You're not on a set now. And mine's, and mine's a cup of coffee. Slap it down. <laughs> there we go. And you're awake. Okay, I'm back at home now, back yes. Home. Right. Yeah. Well, it's amazing, isn't it? Because it only takes one person to go, come on, don't be a dickhead. That's not, that's not you. And then if you snap out of it, then they'll get you in time. Yeah. Were you, was it instilled in you at drama school that this was a viable profession? How was it um, pitched? It wasn't really. I don't, I, I don't think any of they didn't. No, they did. I think at that time, I think acting was a bit of a um, hobby for a lot of people. You know, so there was a, there was a, 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 the idea that somehow. <laughs> Just reminding, no vaping in the York Theatre Royal. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. Um, Malik. There was some the, people unbelievable. The, there was, um, it was different because, you know, we had, I mean, this was a theatre that you wanted to come and play in, mm. you know, you wanted to be in the reps, you know, I was very fortunate, I, I got as near to York as, as Leeds, that's where I did my first play. And, you know, the rep theatre was what you wanted to do. You wanted to get into the reps because that's where... more training. Well, that's where you were going to learn more and more. You were going to learn about stagecraft. You were going to learn from other actors. Exactly. And, you, and you, you'd sit there and, at the read-through and you'd hear these people say these lines and you'd think, wow, I never thought of emphasising that word in the sentence. Yeah. You know, and, and so, so you learnt lots and lots and lots, and that's what was wonderful about the rep theatre. But I don't think anybody, you know, we, we, it, it's a stardom wasn't what we did it for. You didn't think about becoming a star. You didn't think about your name above lights or any of that. You just wanted to be, you know, if, if to this day, I love it if somebody crosses the road and sort of, first, most of the time when people cross the road and come over, they go, I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Malik, but I just wanted to say you're a fantastic actor. And you go, thank you. And they go, you don't mind. I go, you're the one that's just crossed the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And be gracious. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if you can do that and if you can, if you can, if you can keep that going, then, yeah, I mean, four decades now. Well, five, five Is decades, it? yeah. So tell me about leaving drama school. Um, well, you know, we talked about getting everybody cards and everybody had a job and everything. Yeah. Well, there was one who didn't. You're looking at him. No. Yeah, I was the one that had nothing. 
Like, you know. How did you feel at that point? Well, because it was very difficult, because you'd go up for something and they'd be looking at you and they'd say, yeah, the thing is, um, <sighs> one of the plays we're doing, <sighs> we can't really cast you in it. And what they were referring to, of course, was a tonal thing. They were yeah. referring to the colour of your skin. And now we've gone beyond that. And, it's, you know, and, and I was very grateful, sort of like 20 years into my profession, to see that that, that was something that be, people didn't talk about anymore. And also you must have sensed such a dynamic change from yeah. leaving drama school. Yeah. So when I, when I got to... Um, it was, there was a wonderful... I mean, I, I went up for an audition. They were doing Equus. Well, you know, you're going to be playing a horse. Right. You're going to have a, a horse's head on it. doesn't matter what he looks like. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. But at the same time as doing that, they were doing um, A Man for All Seasons. And that's when I got, uh, um, you know, I got to play Lord Richard or one of those. And it was suddenly, it was like, oh, right, it's okay. We're, we're in a good place, you know. Were you prepared for the hard times of becoming an actor? Did anybody um, say to you, look... Uh, we're at drama school now, we're having a great time and the doors are open, we're all playing check off, we can do whatever part we like. Yeah. But you know what, when you step outside into the real world, it ain't going to be like that. Because it is tough. It is tough. As exciting as it is, um, you know, it's that ancient old thing that actors always say, oh, the, well, the most amazing moment is getting the phone call. And then it's a bit, oh, I've got actually do the job now <laughs> and there's half of you going well I think I can do it but I want to make sure I can please everybody and then it kind of well, you there, go on there, a massive there, emotional roller coaster. Well, there was there, I mean there, you know I remember being in a pub when um, you know with a friend of mine he was we were just starting out and things and um, and he was waiting for the time and it was 2.30 and he had to ring his agent at 2.30 to find out what whether he'd got the job or not. So he'd, and he was so desperate. He'd been out of work for such a long time. And here was this job, you know, it was theater, um, theater Cluid or something, or something like that. And so he goes, he goes and picks up the phone and, and, he, comes, and he comes back in to the pub and, he's, and he's, he says, I've got it. And we were all like, oh, brilliant, you got it. He goes, yeah, but it starts next week. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, well, what's wrong with that? He says, well, I was going to be playing football next week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so suddenly there's, it's, it is this thing about, yes, it's a wonderful job to do, it's great to do, but you have to, you have to be a grown-up about it eventually. I mean, I think my, the arrival of my children made me just say, oh, right, okay, there's, I, there's, there's somebody else I've got to take care of now, you know. Because it ceases to become about you. Yeah, and then it became about them, and then you think... Right. And was that quite a moment for you? Yeah. And then from that moment on, it was like, okay. But this had happened. I mean, Jessica had been born. Kira was conceived during the making of Jewel in the Crown. Um, so by the time Jewel in the Crown happened, the, the children were part of my life. And Gina and I had always said that, you know, wherever I went, we would all go. Mm. So I always, you know, right up until Jessica went to secondary school. Right. We always went. If I was doing a film away, we went... I mean, the downside of that, of course, from their point of view, was that they wanted to go, they wanted to come with mum and dad, but there was their friends, they were making friends, mm -hmm. and they had to sort of come back after three months, and their best friend now had another best friend, you know, so it was always... But, um, you know, I, I don't know, parenting, we'll never get it right. Well, again, it's a bit like acting, you're constantly <laughs> failing and learning all yeah. the time, aren't you? Yeah. And I think that's the other thing, is that I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever left work thinking, yeah, that was it. No. I did it. Every no. time I get into the car and we're just nearly getting... And then I go, that's what you should have done. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you Usually you, you get that? into the car and go, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Because oh, no. it's those ones. Where you, I was talking to another actor about this not so long ago, and he was doing a scene with um, a, an unnamed actor, and uh, they'd finished, and he just went, "Yes, high five. And, went, <laughs> and he went, "No, no, there's no high fives." 
he was from York, so you'll work out who it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it isn't, you know, and, and it's, it's to this day, you know, you, you, you do a scene with actors who, you know, between you, you have a hundred years of experience, and you're both at the end of it going, was any good? Do you think we were all right? Yeah, exactly, because right? every, I don't care who you are, it's like... You start the job, and it's first day of school for everybody, whether you've been doing it a year or you've been doing it 30 years. And also, what we were talking about at the beginning, you know, we are talking about learning, you're constantly learning, so it's constantly exciting. And if it gets to the point where you do go, smashed it, then maybe you should think about giving up. Yeah. If you, cause then you've peaked, haven't you? Well, well, you can't, if you can't do any better, then... Well, you can't. I mean, you know, I can never watch anything that I've done unless, oh I've, wa- unless I've watched it at least ten times. I have to get... I have to, the first five is just getting, getting over the vanity barrier just by looking at myself, just going, oh, God, that's awful. Oh, God, you're bad. Then by the time you watch it the sixth time, you go, that's not a bad scene. And you're starting to watch everybody else because now you're not looking at you, you know. But you shouldn't be watching you anyway. I mean, you... Still- you know, that, that, yeah. that, that vanity thing is very hard because sometimes, and I've spoken about this in the past, um, when, in fact, it was when we were working together <laughs> not so long ago, and uh, there was a, a certain type of actor that would finish a scene, so that was very dismissive on it, a certain type of actor, <laughs> a certain type of human being, who, um, after they f- would finish a take, they would sort of rush around... Sorry, I'm just running around the large stage. Like, oh, <laughs> I had to make a point at the, the, the other side there for Aunt Malik. Uh, if you were here, you'd know. If you're listening to this at home, what a glorious moment. <laughs> Art, um, God, I mean, we've got, still got so much to talk about. And we, we just... Do you know, I just want to let everybody know, there is a film, a British film, that we did in 2010... And it's called Ghosted. <laughs> and Craig is absolutely brilliant in it. This was a film that... All right. Cut. Now, this was 2010. There was, there was the recession, right? Everything was... Uh, nobody was working. Trying to say he was paying shit. So, so this chap called Craig Rivera has turned up with this script and said, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. Would you be part of it? And I looked at it and I said, yes, I'd be part of it, but I'd like to help you produce it. And so we then got casting directors in. We got people involved. And the first sentence we said to everybody was, which part of this sentence don't you understand? We have no money. Well, he saw the script... He, he decided he wanted to do it, and all I could offer him was, I said, look, I know you live outside of London, but um, there's two bedrooms at the top of the house, so when you come down, would you mind staying with us? And so he... Myself and Martin Compston um, <laughs> stayed at the top of Art Malik's house for a couple of months here in a film, and uh, we had a lot of fun, didn't we? We had a lot of fun, I mean, we, we decided that actually we, we got because the bill had stopped filming, we actually got their set in South London, which was great. Yeah. And then we thought, hang on a minute, we've got everybody. Everybody's here. Why don't we do something really radical? Why don't we do the first scene first and shoot as if we were doing the whole thing in one? Which we did. Which it, what I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and um, oh, it might have been today on the... Uh, BBC Radio York. Um, <laughs> you, you never shoot in sequence. Never. So you never shoot in story order at all. And um, the film I did with Art was one of the only two jobs in like 19 years that I've ever done. Yeah. I mean, have you ever... No, that was the only one I've ever done. Where we shot it. Day one, scene one. And it kind of worked. And it, and it <laughs> I mean, we had a, I mean, it was a good time because we were all contained in one set. Uh, of the, the, the jail in the bill, yeah. really, wasn't it? it? Yeah. 
And, and uh, you know, and at uh, that time, and everybody that was involved in, you know, the, the, the distributors and all the rest of it, they hated us because they sort of like, what do you mean you've made a film? I said, yeah, we've made the film. We've made it, we've cut it, we've shot it. You know, it's got the score and everything. Here it is, have a look at it. And everybody thought it was brilliant except distributors. <laughs> <laughs> We're not selling it, really, are we? Although if there is you a ever very get a chance to see it, ghosted. Very please. interesting shower scene with myself and Martin Comston. I'm not, I'm not very nice to him. I mean, I'll let you fill in the blanks. <laughs> Don't say it, Craig. Don't say, see, I had a gag there about filling in blanks, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to go... You went there. I didn't go there. Now, um, we've got to talk... I'm jumping. If you've got some jewel, jewel in the crown questions, get them sorted now. I'm jumping over there in a minute because I want to talk about um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and True Lies because and I don't know if you told me this or I read this, that after that you were concerned about being typecast as a terrorist. Yes. But that was because when we, when we made True Lies, it was a melodrama. You know, there was nothing, you know, because it was 1995, you know. In 1992, they, you know, some people had tried to blow up the World Trade Center. I mean, they'd got it spectacularly wrong. Um, and, you know, I mean, even to the fact that, you know, they got caught because the guy who hired the van wanted to get his deposit back. Mm. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it was... It, it, Smooth. It, it, so, the, the, you know, when we, did, when we did True Lies, it was a script that I got. James sent it to me, and I just thought, my God, I have to do this film. It was so funny. I laughed, and I just wanted to do it. Well, it is funny. It is funny. And, and James wanted to do it. James Cameron wanted to do it because he, wanted to, he loved the Bond films, and he wanted to make a homage to, a homage to the Bond films, really. Arnold wanted to do it because... Um, That's uh, Schwarzenegger. <laughs> In case you... <laughs> Arnold wanted to do it because... Thrust. Over there with Hugh Bonneville at the you know, back. <laughs> because he just worked with Charlie Dance in a film which went spectacularly long. Wrong. <laughs> so, you it, you're piling them up know, here, I know. So amazing. I thought, well, I'll help him. You know, I'll help him get his career back on track. So we, we did it. And it was just fun. It was great. We were even going to do True Lies 2. No. Yeah, there was True Lies. I was going to come back as my... Mike's twin. <laughs> God love a twin. I love a twin. You know, we can come back as a twin. And then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, that was when I went, no, that's it. I'm not doing this. Because I could see that what was happening was that we needed to tell stories from the victim's point of view. We needed to tell how, it, how th that form of terrorism was affecting us. Mm. And whereas what I was concerned about and have always been concerned about is what makes a terrorist? Why do you think, why would anybody, if they've got a full fridge, if everybody's happy at home, why would they want to do something so appalling? And that was never going to be addressed. And it probably won't be addressed for at least another 30, 40 years. Do you, were you inundated with... Yes. I don't even need to finish the sentence. Yes. I was going to say terrorist parts, but you probably <laughs> filled in the blanks as well. Don't fill in the blanks again. Don't <laughs> think about that. Yes. And so what did you do or your agent do as a concerted effort? I mean, the only thing you can do is say no. I just said no. Just, I mean, it wasn't as if I was saying no because it's this. I would just say, um, can you just say thank you very much, but no thanks, I'm mm. doing something else. And I would. I mean, I, 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 one of the reasons I chose to do Holby City was because I thought I need to get away from all of this. So I, I need do something to, completely different. I need different. to do something completely different. I want to play a doctor. I want to play... I, the, the only two things that, that they said, he's a professor and he's a widower. Right. Which, of course, means, yeah, you know, one is that he's high status and the other one means that he can have a girlfriend every week. There you we know, go. Happy days, go. Happy, happy days. But, you know, and so part of that was, and, and they said, is there anything that you want to talk about? And I said, well, yes. One of the things is that I think it would be nice if you're going to give him a Muslim name, that he is a Muslim. I think the fact that you're making him the, the, the sort of moral centre of the piece is rather flattering and, and lovely to do, and I think that's right and proper that we do it. 
Um, and I had a, f- a, a fantastic time. I found it a little bit scary because of the, the, just the, the amount of work that you had to do, you know, because you're doing three scripts at the same time. Just not to sort of um, be patronising in any way, when, um, say, we were doing a film together, the amount of pages that you would film in a single day could be anything from two or three. So very, a very, very small page count on a feature film because you've got the time and you've got the money. Whereas something like Holby would be... Ten pages? Uh, ten pages. So there's a, there's, there, there isn't yeah. time for you to go, sorry, can we just... I think we should yeah. just do this again. There's no 20 takes. And, I said, mean, and, and I had said that he should be... Because they said, you know, we, we want him to be a cardiac surgeon. And I said, can't he be an anaesthetist? And they looked at me and was like, well... There's no drama in being an anaesthetist. And I said, well, all right, let me tell you a story about an anaesthetist I know. I said, he was at St. Thomas's, and this man had been brought in who had fallen in front of a tube. He had bones that were broken. Um, he, had, he had very little chance of surviving. Mm. And so the anaesthetist who, if, if there are any anaesthetists in the room, they, they'll know. They represent the body, the body as a whole. And so my friend, the anaesthetist, was there, and he was looking around while, you know, the, the cardiac surgeon was saying, well, I'm going to be doing this, and the brain surgeon was saying, well, I'll handle this, and then the, you know, the... the um, orthopedic surgeon says, well, I, I need to do all of this first. And they're, they're all three talking amongst themselves. And the anaesthetist could see that the man was dead, that there was no point. And he said, I'm calling it, gentlemen. And they still talked and talked and talked. And he said, gentlemen, I'm calling it. And they were still talking talking. And he went over to the mains and he just turned everything off. That was the power of a man who represents the body. And it was his responsibility to say, you are not thinking about the body. You're thinking about bones. You're thinking about the head. And so I told this story to the writers, and they said, yes, that's a brilliant idea. So we'll make him an anaesthetist. And then I found out from anaesthetists that when they're in operations, there's, there's, a, sort of, there's a, 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 a sort of sheet that goes up this side. So the head's here sheet there and then there's all the surgeons doing whatever they want and this is called the brain body so the brains are over here which is what the anaesthetists think of and I said and we would all have to do with you know masks now when you're doing a scene with masks nobody can see what you're saying can they really not really so of course all the other actors that had their mask on and I decided as an anaesthetist who I'd been shadowing who never wore a mask right I went, well, I'm not going to wear a mask. So I would learn my lines, and I'd be there doing everything. And I'd be saying my lines to my great friend, Hugh Quashie, who's, who's uh, one of my big buddies. And he'd be sitting there with his thing on. He'd go, and I'm trying to act with this man, you know, who's, who's classically trained. He's been at the RSC. And then the other actors all go, and they're all just, what happens afterwards, of course, is that they then all get the script out. And then they read the script. So they've all read it, and then the sound mode puts all the tracks in. So there you are. You see, so those people in Holby City, if they've got a mask on, they have not learned their lines. <laughs> You'll never watch that show, The Sick. <sighs> So I will cut that bit out. Um, I've got a couple of more things Good. that I want to talk about before we have to wrap it up. But um, I just wanted to throw it open to the, the beautiful audience of the York Theatre Royal. Hey! Does anybody have um, any questions for Art? Yes, sir. Well, look, yeah, no, well I, I rang my father up when I, when I did Holby, and I was a professor, and I rang him up, and I said, Dad, you never made professor, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did he have a comeback for that? He didn't have a comeback for that. But he just but he went, yes, but you played an anaesthetist. Oh. Yeah, very, didn't go down very well. Bit of a dig. Bit of a dig. Um, <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Don't be shy. I always ask this. 
Oh, yes, gen- lovely, handsome gentleman at the back. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to answer, really, because I, I think that there isn't an actor who wouldn't want to play with Ken Loach. But you know that when you work with Ken Loach, he doesn't want you, the, the actor, to have any baggage. So therefore, you know, he doesn't want anybody to go, oh, he's not really that. He's, uh, I've seen him in something else. So I think it's very difficult. But I can see why he wants to do it. That's, that, that's his trademark. It's sad for uh, actors like myself who would love to work with him. Don't say that. I'm working class northern. I've got much more of a chance working with Ken Loach than you have. I mean, we've got... Let, let's be honest, oh, you know what I mean? Um, I've got no chance. Um, do, is there any more questions? Please do not be shy. Is everybody knackered? Is everybody down for a wee? You know what? Have you enjoyed it, though? Yeah. It's been a nice night, right? Um, I've just got two things that I just want to sort of wrap up asking with art and there's always two things that uh, not necessarily are asked by me in over a hundred episodes of the, um, the podcast that we've done I wanted to ask you two specific things and I never really asked questions because I just want the conversation to kind of just like be two mates down and form or something um, have you ever thought about not doing this has there ever been any dark times when you've gone I just can't do it. It's too much. No. Never. Never. Even, have you ever even flirted with the idea? No. It's the only thing I, I know what to do. And what's happened as you get older is, is you know, the, the, when you start out, you, of course you want to play the leads and all the rest of it. And now I look at parts and I just go to scripts and I go, two scenes. Bang. Wow. Brilliant. <laughs> And then you turn up and you say, yes, you're going to do it. And they send you a rewrite and you go, three seats. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But it's, it, you know, you just, it's, yes, of course. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 66. I, I, I want to play th- those roles. I want, to, I want to explore what it's like to be a grandfather. And, you know, I, w- I want to play those sort of parts, which I'm thankfully being able to do. You know, whereas before... There were certain things that one did, and I, you, you can't go backwards. You can't repeat those performances. You can sort of, you can play those young leads, and you can play certain people at a certain age. Now it's like, you know, well, yeah, this is this is great. And of course, priorities change. And priorities change. But you stay, you keep moving forward because, as we've spoken about before, you keep learning and you're striving to learn. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, two, I mean, uh, nine. 2015, an Indian director got in touch with me and said, you know, I, I hear you, you, you know, you can speak Urdu. And I said, yes, I do speak Urdu. It's my mother tongue. And he was making a film about a Punjabi um, called Bhag Milka Bhag, which was, this was a true story about a, 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 an Indian athlete and called Milka Singh, who was known as the Flying Indian, the Flying Sikh, and he, and he broke world records on the 400 metres. And, it was, it, and I just thought, oh, my God, this is going to be brilliant. I'm going to actually be in a film where I'm going to be speaking Hindi. And it was wonderful, you know, and to have that. And then th- 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 that one went down rather well, so I did another one. Um, that one didn't do too well, so I haven't done another one since. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just want to... I, I stole a question, and it, I don't ask it on every podcast, um, but uh, sometimes the broadcaster, Marianne Hobbs, asks a question, and I remember when I first heard her ask it, I went, wow, people don't ask that. So I nicked it, and I sometimes ask people... Are you happy? Unbelievably. Yeah, I'm happy. That's good enough for me. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Mr. Art Malley!
episode is done and what an absolute corker of an episode. So look, a massive, massive thank you to JB for coming out and warming up that crowd the only way he knows how. My God, he was on fire and the audience were killing themselves. It was beautiful, so poetic and funny and warm, but heartbreaking in equal measure and Shit like that goes a long way, and it really does. And also, Art Malik, I mean, what a beautiful, sensitive soul he is. And I can't thank him enough for making that huge train ride from Devon to come and see us. And also, you lot, you beautiful, kind, lovely mob for coming and supporting and saying hello it absolutely means the world that you came out to both myself and Griff. Well, you know we're going to hit the pause button now, just for a few weeks, just to get some clarity and come back. And the next four episodes that you're going to hear when we come back are going to blow you out of the water. One of them especially, you will need a lie down after it, I promise you. But again, this is essential conversations that need to be happening and that's what we do at the two shot podcast and it's going to come back bigger and better as always look it's only a couple of weeks so until then i've been craig parkinson he's been producer griff and this has been the two shot podcast and i'm absolutely shattered so i'm going to go to bed take it easy guys stay safe stay sound lots of love Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers.